The answering machine came alive. As soon as Linda Inghilary heard the voice on the line, she dropped everything she was doing and rushed to the phone. It was her goddaughter, Katie Beers, and she was in terrible danger. It was a man who kidnapped me and he had a knife. Oh no, here he comes, I gotta go. Katie. The phone rung 19 times before Linda picked up the receiver. What if the captor had heard little Katie because of her carelessness? Linda called 911 right away. Surprisingly, she was not the only one to report the crime. So who is the other caller? Let's investigate this story of severe hardships and exceptional bravery with Call It Crime. Katie Beer's 10th birthday was a mere two days away, but she was celebrating early. John Esposito, a family friend whom the neighbor kids affectionately called Big John, came to pick her up. He was going to take little Katie to Spaceplex. Spaceplex was an indoor amusement park and arcade. The Inghilaries didn't treat her to things like that often, so the kid was ecstatic. However, just hours later, John called 911 and reported Katie missing. Last time I seen her was when I gave her the front house and she was walking towards the machine. The police cordoned Spaceplex off but found no one suspicious enough to arrest, but they had evidence to work with the tape from Inghilary's answering machine. It was quickly determined that the call Katie's godmother received was made from a payphone just outside the arcade. Dominic Verone, the head of the Long Island Kidnapping Division, listened to the tape and narrowed his eyes. The kid's pleas sounded artificial to him. A nine-year-old using a word like kidnapping? And it was only getting weirder. The investigators started narrowing down on the suspects, that is, the immediate family. After all, most abductions are orchestrated by relatives of the very kids they report missing. Godmother Linda looked concerned, all right. And she said, oh, oh my God, here he comes. So by the time I picked up the phone to get to talk to her, I, I got nothing. When the police asked around, the Inghilaries raised a lot of suspicions. Katie was an unwanted child, and her mother Marilyn often left her in the care of her godparents, Linda and Sal. One would imagine that things might look up for the kid in the new home, but nope. Instead of salvation, she got exploitation. Katie found herself cooking dinners, lugging laundry down the block, or fetching cigarettes and junk food for her elders. As if that wasn't enough, Uncle Sal abused Katie since she was a toddler, turning her life into a living nightmare. When she finally built up enough courage to tell Aunt Linda about this, the woman called her a liar. On the other hand, Inghilary's neighbor, John Esposito, was Katie's best friend. The girl wasn't allowed to attend school, and Big John was always there to keep her company. However, the police quickly realized he was an even better suspect. Witnesses at Spaceplex stated that on the day of Katie's disappearance, Esposito entered the arcade alone. Meanwhile, Detective Verone confiscated Inghilary's answering machine along with the tape and sent it to the FBI, and it was revealed that the message Katie left was pre-recorded. How did they know? There was zero background noise. Big John found himself in a very unfavorable spotlight. He became the prime suspect. With the new evidence at hand, the investigators entered Esposito's house. It looked like a pretty dilapidated bachelor pad, but the missing girl was nowhere to be found. The police put Esposito under surveillance. By then, the case went public and was all over the news. Bloodhound reporters were right there, sniffing the air and watching Esposito's every move. And then, 17 days into the case and seemingly out of the blue, Esposito came forward and turned himself in. He led the investigators into his house, into his study, and then the bug-eyed policemen and FBI agents observed how the man pulled out a bookcase to reveal a hidden room behind the wall. The concrete block had to be lifted to reveal a seven-foot shaft connected to a place best described as a dungeon. In the crumpled six-foot by seven-foot bunker, there was a coffin-sized box, a couple of TV sets, a toilet bowl, and a bubbly Katie Beers. You'd expect to find a child after spending 17 days in an underground chamber, trembling, scared, cowering, withdrawn, and instead we find this upbeat, 
young girl talking about things like her pet dog. So, what actually happened? Let's dial back to the day of the abduction. Big John was probably the last person that I could have imagined having ever hurt me in such a way. Once Esposito picked up Katie, he took her to his home. He let her play some video games and then just grabbed her and pushed her down the concealed shaft behind a wall in his study. The food she was getting was inadequate. It was junk food and soda. Imagine a little girl surviving on this stuff alone. Katie cannot stand chocolate after dinner mints to this day. But the kid refused to give in to the circumstances. She didn't lose hope, which proved pivotal to her survival. You have to have something to fight for that's going to keep you going day after day, um, night after night, hour after hour. Honestly, I think that if I had given up any hope of surviving, of being released, I wouldn't have survived my ordeal. One might wonder, how did the kid manage to survive? Katie was strong. Sadly, she'd had plenty of experience with this type of treatment from adults. The truth is, despite fearing for her life, the little girl wasn't that afraid of Esposito. Instead, she was wearing him down. Right at the beginning, Big John asked Katie to lie down on the concrete floor and play dead. Esposito wanted to use the photo to shake his pursuers, thinking that if the police assumed the girl was no longer among the living, they'd leave him alone. Unwittingly, he shared this plan with Katie. But the kid said no. The smart girl knew that if she agreed to participate in this trick, she could kiss her life goodbye and she was extremely cautious not to let Big John catch her unawares. She slept very little, fearing Esposito'd snap a pic of her while she was floating in the dreamland. She didn't touch any food that wasn't prepackaged. She believed her captor might put something in her meals. Another thing was that Esposito got to chaining Katie, but the kid outsmarted him even here. Before he brought the shackles in, the girl noticed a keychain on a shelf. She grabbed it and hid one of the keys under her pillow. Big John came down with the chains and locked Katie in place. When he left, the kid tried the key on the padlock, and it worked. But what if Esposito noticed something suspicious? Katie counted the chain links, eight from the padlock to the wall. When Big John left, she unchained herself to move about more freely. Once she noticed that her captor was coming back, she promptly chained herself back. It looked as if nothing happened. The whole time of her captivity, a TV was keeping Katie company. She watched the news and knew that the police and the FBI were tirelessly working on her case. But because Katie was able to unchain herself freely, she watched another TV too, a closed circuit one Esposito installed in the bunker. It showed her what was happening right outside her captor's house. She knew that there were chances of her getting released and stayed strong. But she had another trick up her sleeve. During my captivity, I was asking John Esposito questions about how I was going to like go to school, what I was going to do to survive, I wanted to get married and have kids, and he would always have witty remarks right away like, oh, you'll have kids with me, you'll marry me, you'll do this with me. These questions made the captor think in the long term. There was no escaping the fact that before him, there was just a little girl with her whole life ahead of her. With the police and the media breathing down his neck, Big John's psyche started to give in. And when Katie told him she was sick, this clever lie broke the camel's back. Later, Katie would say, being abducted was, unfortunately, the best thing that happened to me. I would have never gotten out of the abuse situation I was in. It might sound deranged, but the abduction truly helped her escape the hell she was living with her godparents. The godfather, Sal, got what was coming to him. He was charged and convicted for his transgressions, and having spent 12 years behind bars, died in prison in 2009. Esposito got 15 years to life. He was found dead in his cell in 2013, shortly after his fourth parole hearing in 20 years. But what about Katie? How did her life unfold after that? Law enforcement stepped in to plead with the media to leave the kid alone. We as a society must protect this child, or our professed love for our children is just a fraud, and our so-called compassion for each other is just a mockery," said James Catterson, the district attorney. Luckily, Katie was given the privacy she deserved, and despite her mother's protest, she was promptly adopted. She went on to play volleyball at East Hampton High, become a cheerleader, and participate in drama productions. 
She went to college in Pennsylvania, where she earned a degree and met the man who would become her husband and her father of their two children. I try not to be sad about what happened because, ultimately, it made me who I am today, and I'm very satisfied and happy with my life," Katie Beers said. In 2013, Katie broke her silence. Together with WCBS-TV reporter Carolyn Gusoff, she penned Buried Memories, Katie Beers' story, a memoir detailing the case and how she was able to overcome the trauma. Today, Katie's an inspirational speaker and uses the experience of her past ordeal to help other survivors, and here is what she has to say. I grew up in a world where abuse was swept under the rug and not reported. Abuse wasn't reported because the community didn't know it was happening. Abuse wasn't reported because the community turned a blind eye, ignored it, didn't report it, or didn't know where to report it. I feel blessed to share my story of recovery to the world. I've spoken at numerous conferences, summits, and workshops around the country in hope that other children can grow up in a world where people are aware of abuse and neglect warning signs and to help others with their own recovery. Indeed, no matter what ordeals life shoves you in, there's always a way out, and Katie's story is a perfect example. Stay safe.